I'm Sir John Peace, and I'm the Lord Lieutenant of Nottinghamshire, the Queen's representative in this great county. Today, I'm launching the Platinum Jubilee here in Nottinghamshire. This is going to be a series of events taking place throughout the year, including beacon lightings, including street parties, including parades, an opportunity for all our communities to join in. Now, although um, there will be very special set events taking place throughout the Jubilee, it's important everybody has a chance to join in. So I'm asking you, have you got any special memories of Her Majesty the Queen, perhaps on visits to Nottinghamshire? Because if you have, please let us have them and we will make sure that they are published and, and put onto our websites. It promises to be a very special 12 months, and particularly at the beginning of June, there is so much happening. We hope you have a great time, and I look forward to seeing many of you at that time. I like my job because when you go home, you know you've made a difference. Because it's just, it's just happy, it's nice knowing, it's a very rewarding job, very rewarding when you've Help. It could be like the tiniest thing that you've helped someone with, but it's like massive to them. Just generally making that difference, because like I say, some people don't see anybody, or they've got a son that lives 40 miles away that comes on a Wednesday, you know, and that's, that's all, all they see in general. And it's just nice that you made a bit of a difference to them, you know, conversation, chat. They are brilliant. Richard, the Kerala, and Leah, the Kerala. They are absolutely brilliant. I can't fault them. It can be a very stressful job, but on the other hand, you get more rewards out of it than you do to stressfulness. And it's nice going to service you with them and smile at you. That's that, you made the day. If you walk in and smile at you, you know, you've done something right. I actually did something completely different before, but because um, I, I looked after my grandma a lot, so it like, it forced me to go in and help other people. So if I could do it for my grandma, I'd do it for everyone else and best job I've had so far, to be honest. <laughs> Come in and I might be feeling a bit low, and Richard will say, good morning, Doris, and I'll say, good morning, Richard, good morning, Leah, and I might be feeling a bit low, and then all of a sudden, them just saying them words, good morning, and how are you today? And they cheer me up really, really lovely. It's like a lot of people, I think, Oh God, Karen, I couldn't do that. But community is so much different. Like, some people will just go and see it to have a chat with them because they're lonely and they just want to see someone through the day. It's not all, like, just all physical work. Sometimes it's social and interacting with them. It is quite flexible. I mean, I don't have to dedicate. If I wanted to dedicate my life to it, you can, but you don't always have to as well. Sometimes I feel like I could put my arms around them and cuddle them because they're that good. And anybody that says they ain't, Come and see me, I'll tell you.
morning, members. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please remind you to ensure mobile phones and other devices are on silent, that banners, etc., are not permitted, and members of the public are not allowed to address the meeting, to use the microphones which are available when you are addressing the meeting, and that you may be filmed or recorded during the meeting. Thank you. Please be upstanding, you all are, for your chairman. God, our Father, as we gather from across, the from across the county for our meeting today, let us remember that we are here to serve. Help us to act with real character and with real conviction. Help us to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help us to especially speak with charity, with clarity and with, with, with restraint. As we as you guide us, we pray that you will help us to satisfy the needs that need to be met during this meeting. Strengthen us as we make decisions. May we be like a well-watered garden, a spring whose waters never fail, so that we can be fruitful and productive. Help us to be effective and decisive. Amen. Let's pause now just for a moment and pray for world peace. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Enjoy your meeting. <laughs> Can we settle down, please, everybody? <laughs> Can we approve the minutes of the last meeting? All those in favour? That's clearly carried, thank you. Apologies for absence. Council Barnfather, do we have any apologies? Yes, thank you, Chairman. I have apologies from Dr uh, John Doddy, other reasons. Councillor Mike Introner, other reasons. Councillor Eric Kelly, uh, Kerry, illness medical. And Councillor... Turner has held up in traffic and we're with us shortly. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have apologies from um, Councillor Sheila Place, Place for medical and personal reasons. And uh, Councillor John Clark is going to be late this morning for medical reasons. Thank you. Councillor Deakin. Apologies, Mr. Chairman. I've got apologies from um, Councillor Deakin, who is, will be here shortly, along with Councillor Williamson. Elizabeth Williamson and Councillor Daniel Williamson has put his apologies for medical reasons. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Declarations of interest. If any councillor or officer has either a disclosable pecuniary interest or a private interest in any matter on the agenda, you should declare it now. Please raise your hand now if you have an interest to declare. And when called to speak, you should state whether it is a disclosable interest or a private interest and give brief details. Anyone, any interest to declare? No? Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is Chairman's Business. There are no awards to present and I don't propose to go through all my engagements since the last meeting. I'll say that over till March as we've got a very busy day today. <laughs> Can I remind members that under the regulations passed by the government in February 2014, there must be a recorded vote on any budget amendment and the final budget motion. 
As such, there will be no separate show of hands vote, only the recorded vote for any amendment and the final motion. May I also remain, remind members that the end time limit for this meeting is 5.30. The meeting will only continue beyond this if necessary and not beyond 8 o'clock. At 6 o'clock, I will be re reviewing the list of speakers because the, we will have some considerable time to w wind up on the amendments and the motion and take re three recorded votes, possibly. And therefore, at 6 o'clock, I'll be taking a view on whether to take any more speakers or not so we can conclude promptly at 8 o'clock at the latest. Lunch will be at approximately 12.30. Agenda item five, call upon Chris Barnfather, who will move the recommendations in the uh, report. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, following the sad passing of Councillor Maureen Dobson, uh, there was a by-election held for the Collingham Division on the 17th of February, and Debbie Darby uh, was duly elected, and I'd like to welcome Debbie to the Chamber on behalf of the Administration. Um, Obviously, there is an impact, therefore, on the political grouping, Chairman. This report uh, details the percentages now that uh, the new grouping uh, relates to, Councillor Darby having uh, decided to join the Independent Alliance Group. The recommendations uh, are on page two of the paper that the outcome of the by-election be noted, and it be noted that Councillor Darby has joined the Independent Alliance Group of this Council. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Barnfather. Councillor Bruce Lawton to second the motion. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'd like to uh, second the motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Tom Hollis, Councillor Hollis, you've indicated you wish to speak. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. I just firstly wanted to welcome Councillor Darby to the Chamber um, as a member that represents the the county's border, um, as Councillor Darby now does, it is a very tough place to represent. I think as, as we'll all agree that the council's got tight budgets and shouting from the edges of the county sometimes is a tough place to be, um, particularly in some of the rural parts of Councillor Darby's division. Um, it's certainly lots of work required. And I think definitely while I was travelling around the villages with Councillor Darby, um, she's certainly got a love and respect from many of the uh, neighbours that she now represents in those villages uh, and a number of issues that frankly need to be solved there. Uh, and I hope all members from all parts of the chamber will, will agree as they learn to get to know Debbie that she's a very passionate advocate, of course, ran a community centre for over a decade. And, and I think actually it's certainly it's great to see somebody with that level of passion. Um, the only... Um, word of caution that I would have for Debbie is don't forget the Conservatives spent a lot of time, all members in here in your division next time, at the next election they won't all have time to pour in because they'll all be in their own areas so you, you might even win by a few more next time but uh, I certainly welcome you to the Chamber Councillor Darby and um, it's, it's great to see somebody with a level of passion that you've got and a community spirit so thank you Mr Chairman Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, congratulations to Councillor Darby. Uh, uh, just a minute, though, to remember Maureen Dobson and her sad passing. And I'm surprised there's some issues still left, to be honest with you, in Collingham, given Maureen's dedication to the role, uh, Councillor Hollis. And I have to say, Councillor Darby, if you represent your residents in the way that Maureen did, uh, half as well as Maureen did, and Maureen was a true independent, then you were doing a really good job. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks very much. I'd like to welcome a new member for Collingham uh, to the Chamber. As a member of the Transport and Environment Committee, I want to make the Council's newest member aware of that several of us, many of us in this Chamber, are deeply concerned about the effects of human behaviour on the climate emergency. Um, as she probably knows, this, climate, uh, this Council declared a climate emergency last summer. Um, and uh, although this is addressing the problem, it's nowhere near solving it. So I'd like to welcome the new member and ask that she work with colleagues in the independent group, some of whom in positions in authority in other councils, such as Asterix District, to encourage them to follow suit and declare a climate emergency in that district also, should it be proposed again at a full council meeting, as it had previously by the Labour District Councillors back in 2019. Oh, no. Thanks. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> 
Councillor Derby. Okay, uh, Francis. Thank you, Mr Chairman. In making my first speech to this chamber, I'd like to pay tribute to my predecessor, Maureen Dobson. I share the views of so many of you when you pay tribute to her fantastic work for so long for the people of Collingham Division, when you pay tributes to her at the full council meeting on January the 27th. Maureen was a go-getter, someone who delivers results time and time again. It is a massive privilege to me to represent this area now and our responsibility I won't take lightly. Mr Chairman, I'd like to thank the thousands of residents who supported me, but I'd also like to send a message to every resident in the Collingham Division that will work hard for you, whoever, voted, whoever you voted for. I'd like to thank you for my support and thank my family, my local team, members of the Independent Alliance and local residents who helped out in the election for the very first time. Also, to the many hundreds of residents in my division who have signed up to join the Independent Alliance, who are becoming a real voice for change across Nottinghamshire. This is as much a victory for our communities as it is a rejection from the mainstream party politics. I'd like to thank everyone who put their faith in me. I won't let them down. Mr Chairman, I have loved bringing, my family in, bringing up my family in Newark, which is a great place to live and it can get even better. I will fight to our, fix our broken roads and pavements. I will fight to return the accident and emergency and return to services to the Newark Hospital for extra policing to make our areas a safer place. So to the people of Newark, I will fight tooth and nail for A&E and maternity services at our hospital. For Coddington, I take the issue of safety around the school ultra seriously and I will support residents in the fight for safe crossing near the Clown. In Collingham, I will continue to fight to stop HGVs dangerously using the high street. In Winthorpe, Holm and Langford, I'll support the residents reviewing the A46 proposal route that has been today um, been announced. In Barn Beyond the Willows, I will campaign to reduce speeding on Newark Road and sort the potholes on Dark, Dark Lane and Back Lane. In North Clifton, the pathway from the village to the schools need attention. Children there deserve a safe route to school off, on, off of busy country roads. In Gilton, where there are ma major flood issues, I will demand better for you. I know there is no f flood protection, but while all of the, all the villages were installed with the protection, Girton was missed. This council drew up with a comprehensive scheme, but they have failed to deliver it. Those residents deserve better. In South Clifton, the major trail project runs behind the village connecting to Collingham and other villages. It was agreed with the landowners to give land for it, so it needs progressing while the good faith of the landowners are still there. In Spolford, I will work with my independent district councillor colleague, Tina Thompson, to resolve issues with the caravan park. In Bestball, Trent Lane needs looking at to upgrade the surfaces. For the residents of Thorny, South Skull, Wigsley, Harvey, I will fight for the best deal for you. Just like all our villagers, I will fight to fix your broken roads, pavements, to reduce speed in traffic and to be a strong, independent voice you are very used to. This wasn't my victory, it was a victory for our communities who are proud of our independent tradition. I won't let you down. Thank you. Councillor Purdue Horham. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I very much wish to congratulate Councillor Debbie Darby uh, for being elected to Collingham Division and welcome her to our team here at County Hall. Um, and I, I, I also, uh, Mr Chairman, wish to acknowledge and thank the leader of the Conservative group for his contribution to Debbie's election. Um, sadly, I wasn't able to join the campaign through illness, um, but I was able to contribute to the campaign by a personal uh, letter to uh, many of the residents of the division. And um, that seemed to spark off uh, a sort of an impetuous reaction 
uh, from uh, Councillor Bradley. And um, uh, I was only getting a trickle of support from, from that letter uh, before his intervention. And then when uh, he, he, he let rip um, and ranted on Facebook, um, when he let rip, uh, there was an avalanche of uh, calls and emails to me. One gentleman contacted me by phone and said, do you realize you might be the next Spartacus? And, and, and I have to confess, I have to confess, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I have to confess, I never saw myself as, as, as looking like um, uh, Kirk Douglas. Although, although perhaps in a certain light, maybe. But my, my, for, as a, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, as, as I was directing, directing or editing uh, this letter from, from my hospital bed, rather like a mafiosi um, in prison, um, uh, I calculated, I calculated that Councillor Bradley possibly added about 125 to 200 votes uh, to, Debbie's, to Debbie's total. The avalanche of comments that he got from people in Collingham uh, having a go at him. Mr Chairman, I don't wish to take any credit for, for what I did. Because actually what I saw was Councillor Darby and her team working their socks off for the residents of Collingham Division. And I know that uh, Debbie will be a valued member of uh, the Collingham Division and this council chamber. So congratulations, Debbie. I'm absolutely delighted that you are part of our team. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Councillor Zerogny. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. It's not norm. I'm, I'm glad I've got a match now for being a rabble rouser in the chamber. It's fantastic. I, I don't wish to uh, to uh, detract from what Councillor Pordy Haran said, but I, I, I do disagree. Um, which Conservative frontbencher added more votes to our total? Um, <laughs> and I'm not convinced it was Councillor Bradley, but um, I, I do thank them very much for the work they did to ensure we had a victory. Um, Mr Chairman, I of course want to um, welcome Councillor Darby to the Chamber, to this Council and to our group. Um, as many people have said, um, it's actually the work that Debbie's done in her area and as you heard from her speech, getting involved in every village, every town, every part there. And I think um, many members on the opposition benches should take a, a deep look at what can happen when uh, good independents speak about the things that matter to local residents. And uh, I think if one or two people had have seen some of those boxes tipped out, uh, they might have been a, a few more quakes and quivers this morning than, than there, there has otherwise been. Uh, one of the things I perhaps take this opportunity to uh, apologise to the leader of the council about many times I've said to him that combined authorities, reorganisation, the mayor of Nottinghamshire is not on the lips of local residents. They don't care about that structure. And I was absolutely wrong. I was absolutely wrong. Aside from the disastrous, parlous state of roads and pavements, the number one thing that kept coming back on the doorstep was that traditional Conservative voters, and you'll notice this by the, the distinct difference in the district and the county result for the Conservative Party, the distinct difference was that many people, Tory voters, did not want a Mayor of Nottinghamshire. They certainly didn't want a Mayor of Nottinghamshire in Derbyshire. They feel remote enough from County Hall and they don't want another level of bureaucracy. And I was astounded for residents to raise that issue with us over and over again, rather than the things that we get in other areas when we've traditionally campaigned. So I'm, I'm very surprised um, and I think that's perhaps something that Councillor Bradley may want to reflect on uh, before there are 36 councillors on this side of the table and not on that one. Mr Chairman, I don't wish to talk for too long, but I do think, and it's a sad shame that uh, Debbie is a cake maker 
uh, because uh, I'm sure this is like a busman's holiday. But Mr Chairman, I would like to present our newest member, the 14th member of uh, the Independent Alliance. A congratulations, Kate. I'm sure we'll enjoy it greatly. Councillor Orton, you reserve your right to speak. Do you wish to speak? No. I uh, call the mover of the motion for their right of reply if they wish to exercise yeah, it. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I, I'd just uh, like to thank Councillor Spartacus uh, for, <laughs> for, his personal, uh, for his personal letter, uh, which, of course, did fail to mention uh, his uh, reasons for leaving the Conservative Party. Uh, the fact that he was, of course, kicked out of the Conservative Party uh, be because we did not want him on our benches. So uh, he, the, the second minority uh, opposition group are very uh, welcome to him. But it was the old adage that letter of never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I'd like to thank Councillor Darby for her manifesto. Uh, uh, and can I say there were so many mentions of fighting in it she certainly will need the additional police resources that she mentioned because they'll clearly be fighting in the streets in Collingham. And I'd like to just thank Councillor Hollis, who seems to think that Collingham is the only division that is on the edges of the county. I'm sure Misterton probably feels the same way. Uh, I'm sure Carlton probably feels the same way. The divisions down the west side of this county and even Rushcliffe members who live on the edge of the county. And of course, you're absolutely right, Councillor Hollis, we will not be flooding Collingham when there's far more fertile territory in Africa. Who are the recommendations? Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Can I uh, put the motion to the vote then, all those in favour? Clearly carried, thank you. Move on then to agenda item six, which is members of committees. Can I call Councillor Barnfather to move the recommendations? Thank you, Chairman. I'll move the second very simple motion that's before us today that should hopefully take a little less time than maybe the last one I've moved. Uh, there is a duty, of course, upon the County Council following a, uh, an election to review the allocation of committee seats to ensure that there is a proportional political balance on committees. Uh, that uh, work has been done by the monitoring officer and her staff, and I thank her for that. Uh, there are no changes required for the City of Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Fire Authority uh, as a result of the political balance changing uh, and the allocation of seats to the various committees are shown as Appendix A on the matter that is before us this morning. And the recommendation is on page two that the Council confirm the revised allocation of committee seats as set out in that appendix. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Barnfather. Call upon Councillor Lawton to second the motion. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak? No? In that case, I uh, ask the uh, proposer if he w wishes to add anything else. No? Councillor Barnfather, thank you. Uh, so we put the uh, motion to the vote then. All those in favour? That's clearly carried. Thank you. And we move on then to agenda item seven, which is the annual budget and precepts and medium term financial strategy and capital programme. As set out in the constitution for the annual budget meeting, there will be a single debate on the motion and any amendments. I remind you that the mover of the motion has no time limit when moving the motion and when replying to the debate. And the movers of any amendments also have no time limits when moving their amendment. All other speakers will have a 20-minute time limit. Once the motion has been moved and seconded, I will ask each group in turn whether or not they have an amendment to move. Only if the group has an amendment should the member moving it rise to speak on it. <laughs> if there is no amendment, the member should say no amendment, and I will then move on to the next group as we are not debating the motion at this point. If the mo amendment is moved, I will then call for a seconder, 
Once the budget proposals and any amendments have been moved and seconded, I will determine whether an adjournment is necessary before I open the debate. Councillor Richard Jackson to move the recommendation. Um, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. When I uh, presented the final budget of the previous Conservative administration 12 months ago, the government had just published its roadmap out of the COVID-19 lockdown. Some 17 million people had received their first dose of the coronavirus vaccine. Since then, we've seen an extensive vaccine rollout with around 140 million vac vaccines now having been administered across the UK. This represents huge progress in the fight against COVID, but the financial and the practical challenges presented to this council by the pandemic, most recently by the Omicron variant, have been immense. In extremely difficult circumstances, Nottinghamshire County Council has performed exceptionally well, and I believe the ability of this authority to withstand the pressures presented by COVID can be attributed to four things. Firstly, before COVID struck, Nottinghamshire County Council was in a strong financial shape after a decade of modernisation that saved more than £300 million. We released large amounts of money from administrative bureaucracy and reinvested it in frontline service delivery. That's a big reason why we are not one of at least 20 councils reported to be in active discussions with government seeking extra money to avoid bankruptcy. Secondly, Mr Chairman, Nottinghamshire County Council has received excellent additional financial support from central government to cope with the pandemic. Since March 2020, we've received some £165 million in COVID-related grants and funds, thanks not least to some very successful lobbying, firstly by the former leader of the council, the Honorary Alderman Councillor Kay Cutts, MBE, and now by our current leader, uh, Ben Bradley. MP, whose presence in Westminster means that the voice of this county is now heard louder than ever uh, in government circles. We've seen proof of this success with the council receiving a very good local government settlement, helping towards an improvement of 8.7% in our core spending power. This ranks as the third highest increase for Shire counties across the country, and in fact the only Shire councils to receive a greater increase in their core spending power were our neighbours in Lincolnshire and Derbyshire, which clearly suggests that the government is finally and firmly committed to levelling up the East Midlands with the rest of England, and compared with the underfunding that the region has received in the past. We now await the, income, the, the outcome of the fair funding review, delayed by COVID, and I hope it will deliver a new formula that we will see these improved settlements continue for Nottinghamshire long into the future. We also, learn, uh, we also need a return to multi-year settlements that give us more certainty when preparing our medium-term financial strategy. Right now, Mr Chairman, we can plan our budget around a very encouraging one-year settlement for 22-23. We'll be receiving a confirmed revenue support allocation of 7.3 million, which is 200,000 more uh, than in the previous year, a 33.5 million share of the national 636 million social care grant, which is an increase of 9.2 million on the current year, 7.5 million from a one-off uh, £822 million services grant to spend on frontline services, an improved better care fund allocation of £30.9 million, an increase of over £900,000 on the current year, £2.4 million from a new £162 million market sustainability and fair cost of care fund, £2.5 million from the government's latest supporting families grant, which replaces the previous troubled families grant, and £1.6 million from a total £554 million in new homes bonus funding. Overall, overall, Chairman, this represents significant extra money for Nottinghamshire, adding to the financial resilience of this authority. The third reason the Council has been able to withstand the impact of the pandemic is that we have a truly outstanding group of employees who, gave, uh, who have gone beyond the call of duty to keep, our serving, to keep on serving our residents. Uh, colleagues uh, will reiterate this later on today, but I can say now that this administration and this council leader were pleased last September to grant our employees an extra day of annual leave to be taken by March 24 in recognition for their immense dedication and effort over this period. Chairman, the fourth reason this council is so resilient is that we've had the patience and financial support of the Nottinghamshire public who clearly do understand the huge challenges facing the council at this time. 
They appreciate why a Conservative administration has needed to levy more in council tax and adult social care precept in recent times than we would normally wish to do. In fact, courtesy of Nottinghamshire voters, Conservative representation on this council increased at the county elections last May, meaning that we now have an outright majority and a clear mandate to continue the good work we first begun in June of 2009. We've transformed this authority from an oversized and outdated relic of 1970s local government into a modern, efficient, effective operation delivering better outcomes for residents. It's because of this financial resilience and government support, despite the unprecedented challenges of COVID, that we have been able to maintain services and to provide more than £15 million for organisations, charities, households and individuals through a range of funding streams. And these include almost £5.7 million in household support funding, £3 million in COVID winter grant, £2.5 million in COVID local support grant, £1 million in community funding, over £850,000 in emergency assistance grants, £800,000 for food and essentials, and £1.5 million in social recovery funding, which includes an extra half a million approved through the Communities Committee just last month. But Mr Chairman, there is still plenty more to be done, what are very far from normal times. The additional costs and lost income to the County Council, directly associated with the Covid pandemic over the last two financial years, amounts to around £138 million, and these costs will continue to, accum to accumulate. I want to highlight some of the most difficult challenges facing our uh, children's, adults and place department services in the current and forthcoming financial year, some being COVID related. But on a positive note, I will explain how we, how we plan to meet these challenges through our transformation programme and build on the success of the past decade. In children and families, Chairman, it makes sense to start with children and families department where the financial pressures on the council is perhaps most obvious. In view of the forecast £1.7 million overspent on the Children and Young People's Committee's budget, uh, which we reported at Finance Committee earlier this month, Nottinghamshire saw an 8.7% rise in the number of children in care from 2019-20 to 2021, driven partly by the number of older adolescents coming into our care, although we're still below the average rate for England and slightly below the rate of our statistical neighbours. Last June, the ongoing independent review of children's social care, chaired by Josh McAllister, published their case for change report, which stated, and I'll quote this, with increasing demand at the acute end of the system, the costs of children's social care are spiralling and shifting towards crisis management. Spending on statutory children's social care has increased by 26% in real terms between 2012-2013 and 2019-2020, with a year-on-year -year increase in real terms. So, Chairman, as difficult as the national picture may be, this administration will not accept overspend on our children's services as an ongoing inevitability. And we're working hard to find solutions guided by best practice uh, from elsewhere in the country. In recent months, the Council's senior political leadership team have led a series of meetings with the Chief Executive, the Corporate Director for Children, Families and Cultural Services and other senior officers to identify ways to break the cycle of continuously emerging in-year budget pressures in that department. We owe it to the vulnerable children and to taxpayers alike to achieve a more uh, predictable and sustainable children's services budget position. That said, we will never seek to achieve this at the expense of vulnerable children's safety. We'll always ensure sufficient funds are available to identify and to care for vulnerable residents who need our help, even if that does mean overspending. Our recently agreed Nottinghamshire plan might appear to be stating the obvious with its comment with its commitment to keeping children and vulnerable adults and communities safe, but these are far more than well-intentioned words. The recent appalling cases of the 16-month-old Star Hobson in West Yorkshire and the six-year-old Arthur Lavinio Hughes in the West Midlands demonstrate why we must get it right and get it right every time when we're assessing the vulnerability of a child and deciding who is safe to look after them. So that's why as part of this council's new transformation programme, we're investing an, 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 addition, an initial £1.1 million in what is known as the whole family safeguarding approach. It's it was approved by Children's Young uh, People's Committee last December. We aim to avoid future cost demands on our services by reducing the number of families and children whose lives tear it to a point where they need this intensive help from us. Councillor Wilmot uh, uh, touched on this at full council last month when he stressed the importance 
of early help uh, and intervention. And for once, it was spot on. Prevention is better than cure. When we've, we've been working to this ethos since returning to office here in 2017, but whole family safeguarding takes this to a new level. And let's be clear, early help doesn't just mean focusing attention on young children. The earliest form of intervention to prevent a child becoming vulnerable is to identify and prevent emerging behavioural problems with vulnerable adult parents uh, so that we can stop the problem from escalating to a point where their children become at risk. We're learning from the best practice elsewhere and have specifically commissioned Essex County Council to act as a critical friend due to their role as a Department for Education partner in practice, their Ofsted rating as an outstanding authority and the fact that they are one of our statistical neighbours. Our £1.1 million investment over the course of this administration will combine with existing budgets to fund several strands of work and these will include uh, creating a more stable social carer workforce by growing the number of social work apprenticeships so that in, uh, apprenticeships through the apprenticeship levy and we will uh, provide more support for newly qualified social workers so that we can recruit and retain more of these professionals and reduce our, re our reliance on agency <coughs> social work assistance. We'll invest in strengths-based practices with better collaboration between vulnerable families and the professionals that are supporting them with a particular focus on adolescents judged to be on the edge of coming into care. We will, identify, we'll, we will intensify our multidisciplinary approach to children and family support, bringing together all relevant professionals into one cohesive team, increasing direct contact with families and removing any duplication, delivering more services through our rollout of community-based family hubs. Uh, as recommended by the Independent Review of Children's Social Care, we'll, pro we'll place greater priority on kinship care investing in and improving support to carers who are looking after these vulnerable children uh, of relatives or friends and thereby keeping a child close to their birth family but in a safe place rather than taking them into foster care or into residential care. We will protect and in due course look to increase our in-house fostering capacity as much as we can when the current challenge of COVID uh, subsides further so that more children than we need our care can be found a local family-based home. And to this end, we're collaborating with other councils across the D2N2 footprint to develop our recruitment packages and protect ourselves against better uh, uh, against uh, fee inflation by independent fostering agencies. <coughs> we'll also continue uh, investing in new modern residential care properties with, uh, which accommodate smaller numbers of children and deliver good quality compared with the uh, discredited larger scale institutions uh, of the past. Through this work, over the course of the administration, we expect to deliver a de-escalation of need with more families receiving early help and fewer children requiring child protection plans or care proceedings, fewer older adolescent children needing to come into care, less reliance on procuring high-cost external residential care at a distance, and more children having a consistency of relationship with their social worker and less reliance on agency workers. <coughs> Excuse me. Chairman, with the other uh, current investment that Councillor Taylor will cover later today, we believe the whole family safeguarding programme will deliver improved outcomes for vulnerable families and children throughout the county. We forecast that this can ease the pressure on our committee budgets, not least on our children and young people's budget, by between two and £7 million. Pounds. This may seem a broad-ranging projection, but that's because of our primary focus, which will be on outcomes and not on money. The savings, uh, be they at the lower or the upper end of this scale, will be a bonus, but a welcome one uh, in terms of budget sustainability. Now, of course, we're also just emerging from the COVID pandemic, so it will take time for the benefits of whole family safeguarding to become evident, but this will be a key part of our transformation programme. Um, speaking of the impacts of the COVID pandemic, Chairman, in recent months, the Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee has approved the investment of almost six and a half million pounds over two years in staffing costs and support services to deliver the outbreak control plan uh, and over three point three million pounds in staffing resources for our ageing well and living well services, uh, which maintain uh, immediate demand at, our, at a time of extreme pressure. The Omicron variant of COVID is considered to be far less severe than previous variants, but it has a very high transmission rate 
meaning that a lot of people living in Nottinghamshire caught the virus and had to self-isolate. This saw a significant percentage of the working age population, including our own council uh, uh, staff, forced to take sick leave. The number of days of sickness absence per employee is significant, significantly higher for the adult social care uh, and health department than any of our other departments, understandably so. Our frontline staff face a particularly high threat of catching, of catching COVID during their daily work, which means we have fewer available staff getting stretched even further because colleagues have been off sick. The resilience of our services was tested to the extreme over the Christmas period with fewer staff available to meet huge demand on home care services, support to care homes, supported living, mental health services and community social care. Our ageing well and living well services are well managed and have not previously accumulated waiting lists across our care and support assessment, occupational therapy uh, and community-based services. But unfortunately this changed during the winter due to the uh, in intense disruption caused by Omicron uh, 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 and this aggravated uh, staff retention and recruitment difficulties. The most recent financial monitoring report to my finance committee showed a 2.9 million, million pound underspend, which is 1.7 when excluding public health services, against the current year's adult social care and public health budget. But rather than indicating any slack in the budget, it is in fact an illustration of the COVID related problems that we faced. The main reasons for the underspend include reduced outlay on ageing well care packages, as a result of delayed demand arising from COVID and underspent staffing budgets across the department due to difficulties in recruiting people to temporary and to permanent vacancies, even though our need for staff is greater than ever. Last November, the government published its adult social care winter plan, including a commitment to provide £162.5 million of workforce recruitment and retention funding ring fence to support councils and providers to pay for sufficient staff. This council was allocated £2.3 million of this fund and has targeted it on social, uh, targeted on sustaining home care services which represent our greatest area of pressure. We now have a short and medium term home care action plan in place where we are working with providers to increase capacity and we're examining internal options to support the market. The County Council's quality and market management team are leading this work and have launched a recruitment and advertising campaign through the Council's own channels to attract people to work in the social care uh, department of the County Council. We're, not, we're focused not only on building home care capacity, but also supporting the recruitment needs of care homes as we work to prevent further closures. In the last 18 months, there were eight care home closures in Nottinghamshire, an increase of five on the previous year. The impact of the COVID-19 lockdown and social distancing has also seen an increase in the number of people with complex and severe mental health issues requiring, re requiring our support. And of course, our own staff are not immune from these pressures. As a proactive response to the local mental health challenge, we've invested an extra £778,000 in our mental health support services over the past year and have, ch and have changed our model of delivery to provide 24 seven support. We're working with partners to deliver a coordinated timely response for people experiencing mental health crises. Uh, this, event, this investment is essential given that we received uh, 1,150 referrals to our mental health services in the last six months of last year alone. Later today, Councillor Elliot, I'm sure, uh, another colleague will explain more about our COVID and non-COVID related investments in adult uh, social care and public health. Given that demand is forecast to remain high for at least the next 12 months, this comes on top of the demographic challenges that we already knew about. An ageing population living longer, often requiring long-term, extensive and expensive support to maintain their quality of life. In previous budget meetings, I've criticised successive governments of all political persuasions for their failure to address the growing resource crisis in the social care system. But the current government has gone further than any of their predecessors in trying to tackle this issue. Last September, the government's Build Back Better policy paper, the Prime Minister announced plans to substantially increase spending on health and social care over the next three years, funded through a new UK-wide one and a quarter percent health and social care levy from April of this year, based on national insurance contributions and an increase uh, in dividend tax rates. When implemented, this will raise around 
£36 billion over the next three years, from which £3.6 billion will be used to reform how people pay for care, including the introduction of an £86,000 cap on individual care costs. In December, the government released a further policy paper, People at the Heart of Care, which associated financial, uh, with associated financial commitments, which included £1.4 billion over three years to help local authorities offer a fairer cost of care to providers, £300 million extra for workforce recruitment and retention, £500 million to ensure the social care workforce have the right training and qualifications and feel recognised and valued for their skills and commitment, at least £150 million of additional funding to drive the adoption of new technology, and widespread digitisation across social care, and more than £70 million to assist local authorities to better plan and develop the support and care options for service users. Um, Mr Chairman, the, 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 the specific share of all this national funding that will end up in Nottingham, Nottinghamshire is still to be determined, but coming on top of a local government settlement and the prospect of fairer funding, this should represent good news towards the longer term sustainability of our adult social care services. Two weeks ago, the government uh, published another white paper representing the proposals for health and care integration. These seek to, br to bring together the planning, commissioning and delivery of coordinated, joined up seamless services to support people to live healthy, independent and dignified lives and to improve outcomes for the population as a whole. The aim is to ensure everyone should receive this, uh, the right care in the right place and at the right time. The government is pledging that NHS and local government organisations will be supported and encouraged to do more to align and to pool budgets to ensure better use of resources to address immediate needs and, and also to support long-term investment in population health and well-being. We'll learn more in the coming months. If I can turn, uh, Chairman, now to the place department uh, and another major service delivery area for this council where COVID has caused us to revisit and rethink our previous plans. In March 2019, members approved an ambitious Investing in Nottinghamshire programme, promising a network of modern and fit-for-purpose county council office buildings to deliver services uh, and to boost the county's economic prospects. A report to the Policy Committee stated that the programme would enhance opportunities for more flexible working, reduce travel and downtime, and improve access to office accommodation through sustainable public transport and better parking provision. What we could not have anticipated back in March of 2019 was that exactly a year later, the COVID lockdown would enforce the rollout of flexible home working solutions at a far quicker pace than was originally planned and uh, even was originally thought possible. Our move towards smarter working is, was originally intended to be a, a process of evolution with a strong emphasis on saving taxpayers money and protecting the environment by reducing employee travel and thus reducing vehicle emissions. In 2020 to 2021, the council undertook three and a half million fewer miles uh, uh, travel than the previous year, equating to a reduced spend of more than one and a half million pounds and reduced carbon emissions of more than a thousand tonnes, or the equivalent to the annual emissions of 112 average households. However, what began as an evolution has now become more of a revolution. Driven by the pandemic, uh, this was confirmed last July when Policy Committee agreed a hybrid working strategy as part of our smarter working approach. We have since moved rapidly to implement this hybrid working model with buildings redesigned, new equipment being provided to staff and in the, in the next financial year an extra £5.4 million funded by the COVID-19 grants is being invested in updating ICT devices to ensure employees can work in the most efficient and effective manner uh, from wherever they choose. The effect of this revolution combined with the new administration's decision last May to declare a climate emergency, is that we can now make much bolder assumptions about the reduced need for physical office accommodation. We've already almost halved our office estate, saving £1.2 million per year and reducing our impact on the environment. We've been able to reduce our intended capital spend on the Investing in Nottinghamshire programme from £28 million to just under £21 million, and yet, it remains an ambitious project which will attract new investment, will create more than a thousand new jobs, will deliver 1,000 new homes, and will still reduce further the county's carbon footprint. We will still be investing in a new development at Top Wickham, a new built contact centre at Worksop, refurbishment of part of a post-16 centre in Retford to provide accommodation 
uh, for child support and foster support staff and a building refurbishment in Beeston Central that will provide better quality space for front-facing social care staff. Of course, we already have a strong presence across the county, for example, through our network of 60 libraries managed by Inspire, which will continue to be protected by this administration. We need to maintain good quality, energy efficient buildings to support service delivery. But what we must remember is that it is our employees and not our buildings who ultimately <coughs> deliver our services. As we move towards a hybrid model based on a combination of new modern energy saving accommodation and remote working, we cannot afford to retain old, underused, expensive premises for no reason other than sentimental attachment. The Investing in Nottinghamshire programme has therefore included a review of our wider property and land estate managed through the Economic Development and Asset Management Committee, identifying opportunities for joint working, cost-saving arrangements with partners, and the release of some of our assets, meaning that we can bring certain sites to market in a phased way. We've already managed to cut the number of vacant properties, gradually reducing security and maintenance costs, and we will continue to repurpose, sell or demolish more of these properties in the coming year. Our capital receipts for the current year stand at £5.5 million, which is well on the way to our target of £8.4 million, and we aim to deliver almost £93 million more capital receipts by the 2025-26 uh, year. We'll also use some of our current receipts to pay off future years' borrowing, thereby reducing the pressure on our revenue budget by some £1.5 million in the next financial year. This leads me to recall that when our latest investing in Nottinghamshire decisions were taken, certain independent councillors from Ashfield laboured our top UK proposals as a sham and alleged, and alleged that this county was drowning in debt to finance such plans. These claims got them the desired headlines, Mr Chairman, in the local press, but perhaps those living in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. My attention was drawn to a table in Ashfield District Council's own Treasury Management Strategy, which revealed that by 2023, some 35% of their revenue stream will be spent on servicing debt, driven by borrowing for risky commercial investments. 35%. 35. 35. This represents more than three times the amount that Nottinghamshire County Council forecast spending on servicing its borrowings in the same year. Three times more than Nottingham City. So if, we're so if we so if we're talking about drowning in debt, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My point of order is, Mr Chairman, the LGA has just uh, <coughs> verified that Ashfield District Council's uh, finances are one of the best in the county. <laughs> the Conservative-led LGA. Thank you, Mr Chairman. 35.03%, um, I'll, I'll, I'll correct myself, it's not 33%, it's 35.03% of every pound that they will be spending in the financial year after next, is the facts are, are there in black and white in their own budget report. Mr Chairman, uh, if we're talking about drowning in debt, the group running Asheville District Council should check the whereabouts of their own life rafts before making false claims about this county council. <laughs> Certain of their members were arguing not so long ago that Nottinghamshire County Council should be more ambitious with its investments, and so it's perhaps worth noting that Ashfield are planning to add a further £700,000 to an earmark reserve to offset the risks of their risky investment portfolio, which might explain why they're planning to raise their council tax by the maximum they're allowed to for the coming year. If I can turn to highways, uh, Councillor Clark. Certain Ashfield independent members were equally keen to chase headlines and to make mischief regarding the condition of Nottinghamshire's roads and pavements, but we will not allow political opportunism to deflect us from the task at hand. Can we get on with it? <laughs> chairman, you're doing, you're doing an excellent job of chairing the meeting, Chairman. You don't need three or four others to do it for you. Certain Ashfield independent members are equally keen to chase headlines and to make mischief regarding the condition of Nottinghamshire's roads and pavements. Uh, uh, chair, but we will not, not allow their political opportunism to deflect us from the task at hand. 
please stop interrupting. This is a this is it's a budget speech. We didn't stop your member talking about her political ambitions when she was being welcomed to the chamber. It that is your opinion, but it's not mine. So please be quiet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the previous Conservative administration invested an extra £24 million over three years to begin the immense task of tackling the road maintenance backlog that we inherited from the previous administration. Or to be more precise, thank you, Chairman. The previous. The previous Conservative administration invested an extra £24 million over three years to begin the immense task of tackling the road maintenance backlog which we inherited from the previous Labour administration, or to be more precise, the previous eight Labour administrations. Overall, our expenditure on Nottinghamshire's road maintenance and renewals programme has exceeded £120 million since we took control in 2017. And despite the considerable practical challenges of Covid, 193 of the 250 Highways Capital Programme schemes scheduled for this current financial year have been completed and the remainder to follow as soon as possible. Members are aware that the new administration has undertaken a cross-party highways review under Councillor Clark, uh, which has produced a set of more than 50 recommendations which have now been developed into a new highways improvement plan. Um, it was Councillor Pringle at recent policy committee uh, that pointed out the success of the highways review and the highways improvement plan depends on appropriate funding being made available to implement the recommendations. And again, for once, I agree with him. That's why this administration is recommending today to establish a £15 million earmarked reserve to fund works associated with that highways review and to support our environment strategy. This means that for the second Conservative administration running, we will have boosted the basic highways budget with significant additional resources and shown our commitment to improving the county's roads. Once again, I'll emphasise that this should be seen as the latest stage in a very long process of getting our roads back to the standard that we would ideally like to see. And nobody is claiming that our roads will all be repaired by 2025. What I can say is that the focus of this new money will be on resurfacing more extensive patches of roads. Currently, we have four highways gangs deployed across the county on resurfacing work, but this, uh, we, we intend to invest around three million a year of this extra money to double that number to eight gangs, delivering road improvements across all seven districts. As I've said, this 15 million reserve will also help fund our corporate environment strategy. The County Council declared a climate emergency last May, and as we work towards our target of net zero carbon emissions across all of the Council's activities by 2030. Last month, we agreed investment of £200,000 a year to put a, a new staffing structure in place to respond to the climate emergency and to deliver on that net zero target. The Council's 13 strategic environmental ambitions have been broken down into a 61-point action plan an update of which was taken to Transport, Commit Transport Environment Committee last month, as well as a progress report on our £600,000 green investment funds. Our plans include, to list just a few examples, continuing our programme of replacing streetlights with more energy efficient LED lighting, with a total budget of £4 million included in this capital programme, a carbon management programme, an energy saving scheme with a total budget of more than £2 million to deliver various green invest to save initiatives and then recycle those savers into further such projects. More flood mitigation projects, continuing previous and current good work, such as the £5 million flood mitigation scheme in Southwell, which is scheduled for completion this year and will benefit approximately 240 properties and 60 businesses, and ongoing community tree planting and biodiversity initiatives, and our green, uh, green fleet transport and travel programme. Protecting the environment and reducing our carbon footprint is one of the key ambitions set out in our Nottinghamshire plan, alongside attracting investment and infrastructure, the economy and green growth, strengthening businesses and creating more good quality jobs, building skills that help people to get those good jobs, 
improving transport and digital connections, and making Nottinghamshire somewhere people love to live, to work and to visit. The previous administration already boasted a long list of achievements in pursuit of these aims. For example, we delivered new schools at Besswood, Hawthorne, uh, Orchard Special School in Newark, Hucknall Flying High Academy and the Rosecliff Spencer Academy in Edwalton, and new schools are forthcoming in East Leek and in Bingham. We increased superfast broadband coverage in Nottinghamshire from 76% in 2011 to 98.7% today, 2% above the national average, cementing our position as one of the top three digitally connected counties in the UK. We began the creation of the world's first 5G connected forest uh, with the Sherwood Forest area due for completion this March. We're delivering the 5G digital turbine project thanks to our success in securing £592,000 from the government's Getting Building Fund, which will boost the productivity of more than 40 businesses already on the turbine site and create more new highly skilled jobs. And we're successful in, re in securing £9 million in external funding from Homes England, which combined from four and a half million of match funding is helping our borough and district partner authorities to deliver new housing sites and to increase the supply of new homes across Nottinghamshire. Chairman, the progress continues under this new administration and we're now well on our way to securing uh, the devolution of more powers and more resources from central government that will enable us to take such work and investment to another level. Working with Nottingham City Council and the Borough and District Council partners through the revitalised and aptly named Economic Prosperity Committee, we've been able to ensure that Nottinghamshire and Nottingham is one of the government's first nine Pathfinder sites invited to, be, uh, to begin negotiations to agree a devolution deal. And our aim is to agree a deal uh, by autumn of 2022. Such a deal will involve additional powers and additional money coming from government to deliver a county, city and regional approach to education and skills, to transport and environment, to the economy and infrastructure, land and housing, health and social care, youth services, community safety, tourism and heritage. And of course, in the levelling up the United Kingdom white paper, the government highlighted plans to create an East Midlands free port, a globally connected, world-leading, advanced manufacturing and logistics hub at the heart of the UK. As the only inland free port in England, it will offer unique, exciting opportunities for new high-value, low-carbon investments with skills and innovation at its core, creating thousands of new jobs. We have already received good news through the, integrated, through the integrated rail plan that Nottinghamshire will be on the route for HS2 with associated benefits including a new station at Toton and improvements in the Maid Marion and Robin Hood lines. We also uh, have confirmed the electrification of the Midland Main Line. So Chairman, the benefits of devolution are within reach, but in order to secure them, Nottinghamshire County Council must continue to be in good, sustainable financial shape especially when some of our partner authorities are in a more precarious financial position. If I can put it this way, if I was the Secretary of State looking to devolve significant resources and control to a certain area of the country, like Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, I would want to be confident that it's going to be in safe hands. <laughs> the government stated last year that it would ensure local authorities had access to sustainable funding for core budgets through the spending review. But it also stipulated that councils would be expected to meet demographic and unit cost pressures, and I quote, through council tax, social care precept, and long-term efficiencies. In practice, that means that in 22-23, the government gave Nottinghamshire uh, permission to raise council tax by 1.99% and to raise a total of 3% adult social care precept. This would mean a total increase of 4.99%. However, Chairman, as the Council Leader stated in, his, in this chamber a month ago, this administration notes and recognises that residents across the county are facing rising costs of living. We believe that we should do everything we can to mitigate the impact of the rising cost of living on these residents, and therefore we have carefully considered the impact of the cost of living when determining our budget uh, and tax recommendations uh, for the coming year. <coughs> Excuse me. In doing so, we have had to remain realistic and responsible. This Conservative administration cannot recommend freezing council tax as we did for four years between 2010 and 2013, 
Back then, the council was a bloated, antiquated, unwieldy organisation which was ripe for streamlining. There were many opportunities to make sustainable savings without increasing council tax. And of course, we were not having to manage the local effects of an ongoing global pandemic. Today, the picture is different. There certainly are not another £300 million worth of savings to be found over the next 10 years. And as well as the service pressures I've already described, we face inflationary and pay pressures that are detailed in the budget book in front of you today. Therefore, in light of the significant funds likely to be required, today's budget proposes to create a pay contingency of 10.2 million uh, for the coming year, uh, which will be separate from the general contingency. We're also maintaining a specific COVID reserve of 7.1 million in the coming year, which is prudent and sensible in order to manage the ongoing unpredictable pandemic situation where we do not know what type of severity of COVID variants may emerge in the future. Despite these pressures, Chairman, I'm pleased to say that we will not be recommending the maximum council tax increase. There was a time, it's about 28 years to be precise, when this council would simply have dumped its extra costs straight onto the residents with council tax increases which often ran into double, digit, double digits. But as, as I've explained before in previous budget, pre budget presentations, this Conservative Council now engages in a process of year-round budgeting where we never stop reviewing our services and never stop looking for uh, efficiencies. Thanks to this work, which dates back to June last year, uh, the, the administration has managed to identify £11 million of potential efficiency savings over three years, of which we're looking to achieve around £8 million in the coming year. Most of these savings will uh, need to be reinvested in frontline services, Chairman, but this still gives us a little more flexibility than we would otherwise have had at this time. As a consequence, I can propose that council taxes only increase by 1%, uh, alongside the 3% adult social care precept increase, most of which was already assumed in our current medium-term financial strategy. This modest increase will mean that the total tax increase for Nottinghamshire residents for 2022-23 is in line with many other Shire authorities across the, count, uh, the, across the country and is less than the full 4.99% being in, uh, charged, for example, in Lib Dem Labour Independent Controlled Cambridgeshire or Lib Dem Labour Green Controlled Oxfordshire. For the majority of Nottinghamshire households, this means uh, a bill increase of less than 86 pence per week. In return for which, I can promise that this council will continue to deliver uh, and indeed improve the services that matter most to our residents. Future council tax increases of 1.99% have been factored into today's medium term financial strategy with annual 1% adult social care precept increases through to 2024-25. Now, of course, the Chancellor of the Exchequer may intervene, uh, also intervened rather earlier this month by promising that residents living in properties in council tax bans A to D will receive a £150 rebate to help with the uh, cost of living crisis. The £150 rebate will be implement implemented directly by local authority and households uh, will not need to repay it. This means that almost 90% of Nottinghamshire homes will now pay less in council tax from April than they did last year. Properties in bands A to D make up 88.4% of all homes in the county, with 330,959 Nottinghamshire households uh, to benefit from the rebate. The government measures also include discretionary funding of £144 million to be provided to support vulnerable people and individuals on low incomes that do not pay council tax or that pay council tax for properties in bands E to H. Chairman, it is due to the Conservatives' long-term prudent management of this authority that we do not need to levy the maximum possible council increase today. It's due to 10 years of modernisation and ongoing transformation that this council is in a far better financial shape than most uh, others, including some very near neighbours. I make no apology, Chairman, for repeating the statement in our most recent local, association, local government association peer review report which, shared, which said, and I'll quote, Nottinghamshire County Council is an effective council, there is financial stability in the organisation, and the council has a proven track record of delivering services while maintaining frontline services over a long period of time. This is impressive. Thanks. Chairman, I believe that this budget and council tax proposals today are striking the right balance between easing the cost of living pressures uh, and uh, whilst ensuring that we are not kicking the can down the road to overload them with high tax increases in future years when the cost of living uh, is still to be known.
I recommend, Mr Chairman, this budget to the Chamber and I look forward to scrutinising any and all alternative budgets that may be put forward by opposition parties. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. I call upon Councillor Ben Bradley, MP, to jointly second the motion. Thank you, Chairman. I second the motion and also everything Councillor uh, Jackson said and reserve my right to speak. I call upon Councillor Bruce Lawton to jointly second the motion. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I jointly second uh, the motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. <coughs> Could I ask the Labour group if they have a proposal for an, uh, an alternative budget? Uh, yes, Mr Chairman. Are you going to sp speak yeah. to your amendment? Yes, speak now. Oh, do you need a seconder? Do you need a seconder? Oh. I advise members that at this very moment, the Ukrainian capital of Kiev is being bombed and people are dying. Can I ask you all, could you turn down the physical records that the Ukrainian people are doing? And also, not only the Ukrainian people are doing, but the Ukrainian Can we just support that? that, 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 that Yes, I think we all join in that, uh, and I personally have uh, friends who have relatives in, in the Ukraine, and uh, they are obviously very concerned about the, the situation, um, and I think we, we, we should remember that the public will be watching this debate today and don't want to see a pantomime while people in other parts of the world are being bombed and killed. Jim, we, we will circulate your amendment before, before you move it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Has everybody got a copy? For Kate Watson. Uh, can I just make a suggestion following uh, on from, from the statement about Ukraine? Do you think we should just stop for a minute and just consider a little bit more Ukraine and perhaps make a joint cross-party statement on this to go out there? And, it's, and it is, it's clearly it's what's going on in Ukraine, which is worrying us all. But also there will be families in, in, in Nottinghamshire as well that will be deeply affected by this. I just think it would be a really good idea if we considered it properly and, did a, and, and agreed on a cross-party statement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, Kate, uh, 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 this is a, clearly a very serious issue. Uh, in terms of the technicalities then, if someone would like to second that as a proposal from the floor, thank you, Michelle. On the second, chair. And then a show of hands, please. Uh, and the chairman then to suggest a short adjournment while group leaders get together and consider that. Yes. Okay, yes. Is that, is that ac acceptable to... All the group leaders, well, those that are here. Um, okay, Ken, a, do you want to ask? A joint statement on the Ukrainian crisis before we...
as a as a means of dealing with that, then uh, we could take both amendments, assuming the independent colleagues have an amendment. Yep. To take both amendments, we'll take an adjournment anyway. Then Councillor Fold, at which point group leaders can consider both the amendments and the the Ukrainian crisis. Wouldn't it be standard practice? Yeah. Chairman, wouldn't it be normally standard practice for the movers to present their amendments before circulating them? It's, we circulate the Labour one. No, we, um, no, we, no, we, we circulate yours, Tom, uh, after when we've done the presentation. Uh, at the same time. At the same time, which is what we it's normally very, do. Very unusual, that is. I no, don't, it is. no, it isn't. That's the way we do it, Tom. Thank you. You might not do that that way at districts, and I know we do things differently, but the, it's laid down in the in the procedure. Yeah. Jim, yeah. carry on. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to deviate from my speech very slightly, I think we're actually doing the right thing in putting a statement out for, for Ukraine. So, unusual circumstances. So, I think we can all agree with that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Residents in Nottinghamshire in the midst of a cost living crisis. We've already had a taste of high inflation when prices rose to their highest in the decade last November. On top of that, families are now bracing themselves in the highest increase in inflation for over 30 years. That's 30 years. 7.8% by April, if the forecasts are correct, and uh, they're likely to be out in the wrong direction at this moment in time by the looks of it. In fact, it will peak higher than it did under John Major's Conservative government, as he, there he only saw inflation of 7.1%. 7.1% low considering. 1992, so it's going to be even worse. And add that to what we've been through this last couple of years, it's a very, very worrying time. This weekend, it was reported that we're back to the country of soaring city banker bonuses and a wildly accelerated property market. So backwards we go. In fact, with the exception of financial and real estate sectors, every other major sector of the economy is lagging behind inflation when it comes to actual pay. With hugely inflated house prices continuing to push home ownership further and further away from future generations, our kids, your kids, and rising rents in the private and the social housing sector, all of this will mean yet another real terms cut to pay packets, Mr Chairman, and it will be felt in the pockets of working people across Nottinghamshire. It will mean parents are getting less for their money when buying the family food. So less, we're seeing an increase in food banks. It will mean carers spending more on petrol to get them to work, doing their home care visits, etc., and probably affecting the quality of their work as well. It's nobody wants. And when families get home, they will have another raft of problems waiting for them. Energy bills soaring by hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Rents £62 per month higher than before the pandemic. Water bills expect to cost over £400 a year. Highest fuel prices on record at the pumps. The cost of clothing, shoes and children's school units all going up. And this list goes on and on. I thought it very important, Mr Chairman, to mention and outline the economic state we find ourselves in and the cost of living crisis people are facing because I think it's important to acknowledge it. To let anyone watching in the gallery or those watching at home know we are aware of the hardship and the current economic settlement is inflicting on them and to highlight our frustrations. Because we are not in this together. I wish we were. We are not in it together. We know that big gas company profits are soaring at the same time as all of our whole household bills are still soaring. So that's something in common. Uh, we know the scope we have as county councillors to impact much of this is sadly very limited. But I would hope, Mr Chairman, that many in this chamber would agree with me when I say that we would do anything we can to help Nottinghamshire through the cost of living crisis. And I think that is also the right thing to do, the moral th right thing to do as well. That is why I put forward this amendment to the budget today. It's an amendment which is reasonable, moderate and costed. But more importantly, Mr Chairman, it's a budget amendment which is the right thing to do at this time. 
the amendment centres around four key changes to the original budget. The first, the general element of council Act is not increased in 22-23, and that we only look to increase the adult social care precept by the recommended 3%, to ensure there's continued funding to care for care in the county. Whilst we acknowledge the government will be putting up national insurance to allegedly fix the crisis in social care, that 3.6 billion you mentioned, putting up national care existing budget measures, the adult social care services in the county mean that Nottinghamshire residents are effectively being expected to pay twice to fill in the gaps. We're unhappy with the position we've been put in by the government and think the national insurance rise raises more questions than it actually answers. But our policy in this chamber is to deliver a costed budget amendment and to do so in current circumstances, we're willing to agree to commit into the adult social care precept this year. The second change in our amendment is that this council uses five million identified within the budget related to risks in the care market to acknowledge the already existing care market crisis of significant struggles to recruit and retain care workers by increasing hourly rates of pay in advance and in addition to the expected rises in the national living wage and to commit to working with the government, the NHS and partners to agree a pathway to paying care workers a minimum of £10 per hour or more as soon as it is possible to do so. The third, that this council provides a funding of up to £1 million to allow, allow for seven full-time community liaison officers, one for each borough stroke district in the county to support individuals and families to mitigate the cost of living crisis over the next two years. This will save us money in the long run, actually, as well. And finally, the fourth, that the 15 million allocated to the Highways Review is only spent once the proposals have been subject to review by all members to ensure that value for money is achieved and that the money is spent in the best possible way. And I think we can all agree with that particular one. We're not asking for anything outrageous. As to community layers on officers, to explain, we know that there will be various funding grants, voucher schemes and other posts of money to help people manage the cost of living crisis. But, just like the government's approach to devolution, these funds are unhelpfully scattered across various departments, organisations and locations. Some can be applied for in person, some over the phone and some online. The onus is on the applicant to wake up one morning with all this knowledge clearly in their head and to know exactly where to go and what to do. Without these offices, these funding streams would not be accessed as well as they could be and should be by those who need them. To ensure people across the county get to any support available to help them through the cost of living crisis, we are proposing the creation of seven temporary community liaison office roles. Again, one for each borough and district, working on a targeted two-year programme. The goal of which is to connect as many people as possible across the county, to connect people and families to the help they need. These will community-based workers who will be proactive in networking locally with existing services, charities, community groups and even local businesses to ensure people know there's a person out there who can help them navigate a very complicated set of routes of getting the support. On the topic of highways review, that part of the amendment is simply an acknowledgement that the council, for one reason or another, is again putting money into the roads. Something no one can deny is needed, but a lot of the problems proposed in this budget were supposed to have been sorted out from put on the last budget. That simply isn't good enough, Mr Chairman. We have to be honest and say that the public deserves the job to be done right the first time around. And so what we are proposing with this is a practice which I believe could be replicated across this council, which is a principle that before money is spent on repeat forevermore, we need some assurances. We know to know specifically where it's being spent, how much is expected to be spent and on what, whether the money proposed will achieve what it's intended to, how, so, how sustainable the outcome is. That's extremely important when it comes to pothole and residence and when we expect the work to be done to minimise any disruption. That, Mr Chair, we believe is a change in approach, a helpful procedural function which allows the Council, and in particular us as local representatives, to ensure we have the de detail to make well-informed decisions, as well as a chance to ask the officers, the professionals, if there is any way they 
would do things differently and to ensure we can be straightforward with the public on what decisions were made and that we have made those decisions with the best interests of everyone who uses the roads. A good example of these are where work on the roads evidently isn't delivering the local, for local people, as in parts of my patch of Carlton West. There are streets and roads in my division where the middle of the road has been fixed. People have to drive through trenches or potholes to get to the good bit. And only very recently on the road where I live, potholes were reported, that uh, three or four potholes reported, but to actually get onto that road, you have to drive over potholes that weren't fixed. So it's not, we're not asking for the impossible. And again, this is not the fault of the officers, Mr Chairman. They would be the first to say that rules they work to don't always match the needs of the community. When an inspector goes out, they need to be given the freedom and the time to assess the issues properly. The permission and trust as the professionals to take a whole road approach, which you put down is quite correctly the right thing to do. When it is clearly common sense for them to do so, and that in practical terms means being able to fill in all six or seven potholes and not just the one or two that's actually been reported. So, Mr Chairman, where is helping people navigate the cost of living crisis help with care workers' pay or taking a whole road approach to potholes? Our budget amendment is a moral one, but it's also a practical one. We're simply looking out across the entire county, whatever political colour on the map, and seeing there'll be people struggling, and our, our proposals are modest. They are financially sound, and they are specifically targeting those who need help the most. The motivation for all these months is the same, Mr Chairman. People are on a cliff edge, and if this council continues as it intends with the 4% rise in council tax, this amount this year may be the straw that breaks the camel's back for some people, and what pushes them into difficult financial choices. Some may say it's only an extra £63. But for someone with someone with the income already and living in a band property, this could be the reason someone goes without eating, or why someone doesn't turn on the heating, and so on. So reducing that risk to someone, even marginally, is the morally right thing to do at this time. And the more savings that can be made for those individuals, the better. And it's already been said you are looking into actually how we would take care of people. That is one of the ways. Mr Chairman, the Council are not in a position whereby it's absolutely necessary to increase taxes to this level proposed in the budget. Our legal costed amendment actually confirms that. So notice it's legally costed amendment. So if the members in this chamber were willing, we could come together to vote through an amendment whereby we decide for this year alone we won't raise the general council tax at all this year alone. We're offering the members opposite, the opportunity to say to the residents in their divisions, we know we're going through this, this year, we are not putting general tax off. If we could do more, Mr Chairman, to alleviate hardship in the county, we in the Labour group certainly would. But we know this county is facing a crisis in care and as well as a cost of living crisis. And we know that removing the adult social care precept at this time would not be the appropriate decision to do to the structuring of the precept and the longer term ramifications of doing so. We also acknowledge that in many ways there are problems with the adult social care precept as an instrument of addressing the problems in the care sector, but sadly it's one of the few levers afforded to us by this government. Had we not seen a £115 million reduction in the government's revenue support grant over the last five years, we may be sitting here not needing to raise any taxes at all and ensuring that rather than the additional 5.5 million we're proposing today to raise care workers' wages on a path to £10.50, we could simply guarantee care workers that get £10.50 wage, which their peers are getting across the board in other parts of the UK from down in Somerset to up in Scotland. But some of that won't necessarily get it in Sherwood, Sutton or whatever division you would like to mention. Well, I'm not proposing an imaginary amendment, Mr Chairman, that one, imaginary budget. So I repeat the amendment, the actual amendment. I'm proposing as a modest and a moral one, with important changes to mitigate the cost of living and to acknowledge our frontline care workers, which you've already done with our first line with our, with our uh, employees, which is the right thing to do. These are truly unusual times for many reasons, Mr Chairman. I recently read an article in the Daily Telegraph, yes, somebody gave it there, didn't buy it, of all places raising concerns that families in big homes with small incomes will be hit hardest by energy. 
And the same goes for those families in Nottingham when it comes to council tax rises, especially those families renting in higher band properties. I acknowledge that refusing to put up general council tax this year will not alleviate the multitude of acute problems our residents are facing entirely. However, increasing general tax this year will also do very little to resolve the long-term challenge this council faces. Those challenges are a result of government cuts and their short-sighted one-year settlements. And I think we've all complained about one-year settlements. Well, it makes it incredibly difficult to plan for the future. We're still in the dark about what our government centre will be this time next year, for example, and uh, <coughs> which is no way to manage an organisation, never mind a council providing a vital public service with an annual budget of over £500 million. Mr Chairman, we've seen last year the announcement of a 10-year Nottingham plan, as you've alluded to earlier on today. Currently, it's not really a plan, but more of a vague set of ambitions, and that isn't meant as a criticism, because I'm sure the members opposite will ensure that de detail is on the way. I'm sure they would agree that if we had a government with confidence in local government to deliver such a plan, if this council had been provided with a 10-year funding settlement to do the job properly, the detail may already be there. But it isn't yet. So I suppose we'll just have to wait and see that materialise sometime in the future. How far? Hands in the air. Back to the amendment. We know as a council we can't solve the problems of the economy ourselves. But what we can do, Mr Chairman, is not add unnecessarily to the burden the families in Nottinghamshire are facing. I was interested to see the leader of the council and his role as an MP for Mansfield raise the issues of social care in Westminster this week, albeit in the dead of night around eight MPs, but nonetheless doing the best you can with what you have, so thank you for that. In that debate, you acknowledge that the poor paying conditions that many care workers not should receive. By supporting this amendment today, you're putting your hand in your pocket to do something about it. It may not be a massive change, but we believe it's an important one. It's a statement of intent. It is comment on a, a comment and an acknowledgement. And I think people, people around Nottinghamshire would appreciate that, Mr Chairman. Yeah. We have to be sensible. We have to manage our council budget responsibly. And our proposed amendment does that while offering a break to those who need it and a thank you to those who've earned it. I therefore submit this amendment and ask those in the chamber here, they, here to support it. I urge the whole chamber to actually vote for it. As I say, it's a moral budget. It's for the people of Nottinghamshire. That 1% can make a, di a massive difference to people on low incomes and we don't actually need to take it. We've shown you how to, how to actually raise that money. We don't need to raise anything or alter any of the, your budget in any way other than that. Actually, seven extra employees for two years to help the people. So I would urge everybody here, please support this and vote for it. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Yes, I'll second the amendment and to reserve the right to speak. Thank you. Do the <coughs> Independent Alliance have an amendment? While the papers are circulating, I'd just uh, like to uh, say that the, the procedure for lunch will be that we will break when the Independent Alliance have uh, moved their amendment. We will break for lunch and I'll give you all an extra 10 minutes so that we can consider the amendments and that the leaders can agree their joint statement to go out from the council uh, in, in one um, one one break from the meeting so that we're, we're not jumping up and down and going in and out. So if we if we do that during the lunch break and allow our extra 10 minutes. Went in too fast with that, but trying to slow down. Thank you. 
Oh, he's a bit quiet. No, I don't. I'm not sweet, but I did think you. You are one, Michelle. No, she's on a diet. She's on a diet. She's on a diet. Yeah. Alright, you see, depend on what. There's another one for the Council Waters, if you want to speak to your amendment. Thank you, Mr Chairman. In proposing this amendment, I want to be clear, but what this does is very simple. It reduces the council tax burden while supercharging the highways maintenance programme. This council says it wants to keep council tax low as possible, but maintains but fixing our broken roads and pavements, our dangerous roads and pavements, is a priority. This is exactly what this amendment does. The parlous state of our highways and the way we fix them is the biggest reputational risk to this council. The chairman of the Transport and Environment Committee said so himself at the last council meeting on January 27. Plans to deliver a network of modern county council offices was made by the previous administration policy committee on the 20th of March 2019. Then in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic started and the Railway One services at Nottinghamshire County Council changed forever. Thousands of our workers started working from home as we got used to a new way of delivering services. Indeed, to this day, County Hall remains half empty, with whole parts of it remaining like a ghost town, with deaths gathering dust. On the 15th of July 2021, the Council's Policy Committee approved its hybrid working strategy. In its foreword, it states the ability of many more employees to work remotely or from home, utilising technology more efficiently. The Council will use the learnings from the pandemic and feedback from employees to provide a springboard for new ways of working in the future. In April 2021, this council carried out a workforce wellbeing survey. Half of the respondents saw themselves working a blend of home and office work in the future. A further 32% saw themselves as mainly home-based, with only 6% saying they wanted to primarily be office-based, 14% working in community and other bases. What does this mean for the council's estate? Well, as I said, half of our offices are now empty. The plans approved in March 2020 are for a different world, a world pre-COVID, yet this council behaves if COVID never happened. Nottinghamshire County Council, the new 15.7 million flagship office as part of the new Top Wiggy Farm development in Limby is a waste of money in a post-COVID world. This waste of money was already has already risen by a million pounds since the details were finalised. With rising construction costs, this is set to hit the 20 million mark. We can stop these wasteful plans now. So, Mr Chairman, we are giving councillors a simple choice today. Either put your residents and their concerns first, Mr Chairman, and vote to scrap this vanity project that no one in Hucknall wants, or put their council tax up. An office that no one wants in Nottinghamshire. Even many of your own Conservative councillors don't want it. So... I'd say scrap these plush new council offices at Top Riggy Farm and spend that money on supercharging the recommendations of the Highways Panel. In answer to K 
Councillor Jackson's comments. I make no apology, Mr Chairman, for telling the media that if it wasn't for the persistence of the independent group of councillors on this council, the Highways Review would not have happened. I'm... <laughs> I make no apology also for calling a recent job on Brookside Hucknell a pig's ear job. I make no apology for saying that one of the main reasons you have independent councillors from Hucknell talking to you today is because of the shocking state of our dangerous roads and pavements, our broken roads and pavements. You don't need to tell members, Mr Chairman, that the shocking state of our highways is the biggest concern of residents right across the county. I recently knocked on doors in, Rim in Winthorpe in Councillor Darby's division of Collingham and residents were furious. In my own division of Hucknall South, residents remain up in arms about the state of our roads. When I was asked by this, the count by the council to name my priority areas for resurfacing, etc. I could have named 200 broken roads. I could have named 100 broken pavements. Councillor Steve Carr from Bramcott and Beeston North tells me the same. Residents in Councillor Francis Pardew Horan's division of Bingham East tells us similar. Residents in councillors as a Drodney's division of Ashfields continue to be up in arms regarding the potholes. Whilst cycle lanes are causing chaos on high pavement and the road is deteriorating. In June, I had my first argument with my fellow Hucknall Ashfield independent councillors. This led to a headline in the Hucknall Dispatch. Councillors at loggerheads over Hucknall's worst road. Councillor Shaw claim the worst road is Castleton Close in Hucknall. Councillor Wilmot claimed it was Coronation Road again in Hucknall. However, I thought it was either Vine Terrace or possibly Brookside in Hucknall. I'm sport for choice, to be honest. In truth, if known, there were hundreds of contenders. Of course, Rome wasn't built in a day, they said. That's why we welcome the Highways Review being set up. It undercovered a catalogue of mistakes and should have been accompanied by an apology. An apology for, we've done a great job heading the sand attitude of the previous administration. The administration who were forced to admit that in one year alone they spent more on a paint job on Trent Bridge than fixing Hucknall's broken roads. Shame. The budget as it stands gives 15 million extra from an earmarked reserve for highways and environmental improvements. You stated yourself, Councillor Clark, that 15 million is not a magic bullet to fix Nottinghamshire's roads, but it will go a long way to improve the situation. Well, we'll help you find that magic bullet. So today, we're helping you on that journey, Councillor Clark. You should be thanking the Independent Alliance for coming up with this, sens with this sensible and pragmatic approach. One of the main criticisms this council has faced, Mr Chairman, is that you allocate money via length of roads and not usage of roads. This has led to wealthier areas of the county having roads like Grand Prix sur surfaces. Our fair-minded amendment is not a money grab. We want to see this money allocated in a fair and equitable manner. The Independent Alliance are the fastest growing group in County Hall. We provide the opposition and the scrutiny you need. We want to be fair to everyone in the county. That's why our amendment will give an extra £2 million 
to Bassett Law, an extra two million to Brockstone, an extra two million to Gedlin, an extra two million to Mansfield. Um, Councillor Darby and the independent district councillor Tina Thompson have also demanded two million for Newark and Sherwood. There will be two million for Rushcliffe, and yes, two million for Ashfield. Give us all, more all the talk at the moment is of levelling up. The white paper on levelling up was released on February the 2nd. We all waited with bated breath, but I have to admit I was completely and utterly underwhelmed. The leader of this council, Councillor Ben Bradley, says that residents in this county are desperate for this county council to enjoy more power. Yet, we don't use the powers we already have. Residents of this county just have to look out their window to understand you have let them down. Residents tell us they want us to fix their broken roads and pavements. Yet, all we seem to be talking about is whether or not we will have a mayor or, or a governor of a huge Nottingham and Nottinghamshire combined authority. I asked residents in Hucknall whether they are interested in a mayoral system and they told us, fix those roads and pavements, no question. I asked them to tell me what they thought of the new council offices on top we gave farm. I can't repeat what they said, Mr Chairman. In February, I accused this council of suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. I revealed the research by the Independent Alliance at County Hall that shows that government grants had been reduced by tens of millions per year since 2010. The figures show that government grants have reduced by a whopping 111 million compared to 2015-16. That's just one year's comparison. It is a scandal that taxpayers in Nottinghamshire pay over a quarter more in council tax than wealthy people who live in places like Islington and Westminster. Whilst the £150 rebate based on the 1989 valuations will be welcome in Band A to D households, the reality is, Mr Chairman, that Nottinghamshire County Council has been held captive by a Conservative government determined to axe local government services in Nottinghamshire time and time again. Now they expect you to be grateful for this one-off help and you've fallen for it hook, line and sinker. We are in favour of this rushed announcement, Mr Chairman, but in reality, wealthy people down south will benefit at the same rate that people living in Nottinghamshire will benefit. Houses in, say, Islington on Band D are worth many hundreds of thousands of pounds more, but will get the same help. If you live in a bandy property in Westminster, your total council tax this year will be around the 1,500 mark. Yet in places like Hucknall, Ashfield and across Nottinghamshire, it is well over £2,000. Is this fair? Year on year, the Conservatives in government have axed tens of millions in revenue support at the very time as Nottinghamshire's residents' council tax has dramatically gone up. Government support has dramatically gone down. Councils are on the brink, yet Tory austerity has added £477 onto each household council tax bill for residents in Nottinghamshire. Whilst the £150 council tax rebate is welcome, it is merely a sticking plaster that hides the fact that 12 years of Tory austerity has hit residents in the pocket. 
contained within this budget is a level of debt we are suffering from. I put it to the leader that the only reason that the residents are not talking about the 708 million debt is because Nottingham City Council's debts are far worse. That using a phrase commonly used by the chairman of the Governance and Ethics Committee is not a cause for celebration. This debt is equivalent of £885 per person. Residents need to know just where your council tax is going. For example, just 9% of your council tax goes to, let's say, Asheville District Council. 12% goes to the police. 4% Nottinghamshire Fire and Rescue. And 75%, yes, 75, goes to Nottinghamshire County Council. That means that any council tax rise here in County Hall will hit residents a lot harder than any district or borough rise. In Ashfield, putting up council tax by around 2% will mean about a fiver to your bandy medium council taxpayer. In fact, the rise in council tax in 75% of households will be less than £3. This is why, Mr Chairman, we are asking for the 1% increase in council tax to be frozen and for the money to be taken from usable reserves. We are not asking for anything from the 3% rise in social care precepts. We have to accept that 12 years of systematic underfunding from the Conservative government needs paying for. We can't let the most vulnerable suffer from cruel Tory cuts. So in conclusion, Mr Chairman, I'll finish my speech today as I started it and I ask you to make a choice. Reduce the council tax rise and turbocharge fixing our broken roads and pavements or continue building something our own internal documents say we don't need, that being the posh new offices at Top Wigge Farm. The choice is yours. Believe me, the public are watching, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Do we have a seconder for the motion? Thank you, Mr Chairman. I second Councillor Waters' proposal and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Garner, do you have any proposals for a budget amendment? <laughs> I haven't got a seconder, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you for that. Then I propose that we now adjourn, as I stated earlier, and I give you an hour and 10 minutes. So that means we'd be back in the chamber at 25 to 2.